Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. For many reasons, in recent years, the world has seen stress being placed on its governments, the notion of democratic governance in particular, and there's polarization that makes people on different sides of political issues really turn against each other, really think of other people, other citizens within their country as the enemy rather than as someone they have to learn to get along with. And maybe that's justified in some cases. Maybe it's not, but it's hard to have a flourishing, long-lasting community, democratic community, in a country or in a society that is like that, where people don't trust each other or even think that other people are fundamentally on the same side despite their disagreements. So today we're talking to Margaret Levy, who is a very accomplished political scientist and someone who has thought a lot about the question of what makes a government legitimate. We'd like to think that the people in a democracy are what legitimates the authority of the government. But as a matter of fact, our government's usually there when we're born, right? The government's already there. It's an institution. Most people do not participate in the setting up of the government that they are ultimately subject to. So what is the theoretical justification for saying that the government has any right to have the power over it, us that it does? Why do people for the most part, voluntarily hand over authority to the state, either historically or philosophically. And so Margaret's done a lot of work on this. She's written some wonderful books about it and comes to a set of conclusions that I think are are both really important, but also they seem almost, you know, charming in some sense. Like, oh yeah, sure, I wish it were that nice, but nevertheless, this is a case where that's the way to go, I think. And and what she emphasizes especially is the need for people in a community to under the same kind of government to think of themselves as sharing a fate, a community of fate. Whether or not you agree with someone else in your country about a certain political uh, policy or not, we still are going to live in the same country. We are still going to flourish or suffer depending on how we do as a society as a whole. And we have to take that fact into account when we think about how to make a government and how that government should behave. And a huge role is played by the idea of trust, the idea that we can actually trust our governments to at least try to do the right thing, to be responsible to our needs, things like that. Institutions are sometimes trustworthy and sometimes not. And again, it can seem almost hopeful and overly optimistic and naive to even talk about trust in government at a time like this, but that doesn't make it any less important. And finally, an important role here is played by the idea of empathy and understanding that your fates are intertwined with people who are very far away, people who might not be like you, people who you don't run into all the time. But in our interconnected world, our collective fates are going to rise and fall together. So this is both kind of a descriptive question of how government actually does work and a prescriptive question of how we should try to make things better. So Margaret is extremely eloquent talking about these things and has thought about them very deeply. This is one of those things, you know, unlike talking about black hole thermodynamics, this is something where we've all thought about it a little bit. We all have opinions. So it's nice to talk to someone who is a true expert. And with that, let's go. Margaret Levy, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Well, thank you. Nice to be here, Sean. I thought that, uh, you know, you, you've had a long and, and very productive career talking about really big questions uh, that cross political science and even some, you know, political philosophy and, and other kinds of social science. Uh, I thought I found a sentence that you wrote in a quasi-autobiographical article in Annual Reviews that I thought just mm-hmm. reading it out loud, we could probably base the whole podcast on this one sentence, but, you know, understanding what goes into it. But let me read it for the audience. This is you speaking. My commitment to combining normative concerns with empirical social science led, perhaps a bit counterintuitively, to early adoption of rational choice political economy. 
So on the one hand, that's pretty straightforward, and and but it packs a lot in. So I thought I would you know ask you to elaborate on some little bits of it, starting with what do you mean by combining normative concerns? What do you mean by normative concerns? What are what are the kinds of concerns you have in mind when you say that? Oh, there are a whole uh, long list of them, but uh, we'll start with something I'm working on right now, which has to do with political equality. Um, I'm writing a book with Tim Besley in London and Pablo Baramendi at Duke on trying to understand the concept of political equality and what it means to live in a community of equals. So our, we have a normative goal. We would actually like to make the world more politically equal, at least the democratic world, um, and live up to its help it live up to its aspirations. But in order to do that, you don't start with a set of the principles you want to achieve. You really have to understand how the world is working. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on? What's blocking things? Um, what's facilitating certain kinds of goals? Where the trade-offs are? And those are deeply empirical questions. Sure. So my work on trust, my work on citizenship, all of that work is motivated uh, by deep, deeply held uh, ethical and normative commitments. But in order to create uh, an understanding of how we might achieve those ends requires, at least for me, uh, some in-depth uh, research about uh, how those processes actually work. Well, when you just say the phrase political equality, this is one of those things that maybe sounds good, but I know from talking to people in the real world, I also had Elizabeth Anderson on the podcast some time yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, Fab fabulous. And there are people out there who don't like equality, <laughs> who think that it's a code word for making sure that everyone has exactly the same amount of wealth or something like that. So you put political in there. What do you mean by political equality? Well, when people are talking about economic equality, they're generally talking about distributional issues achieved through a variety of means, but they mean evening out the income and the wealth to some extent. Uh, different people have different levels of what that extent means. When you talk about political equality, you're talking about there may or may not be economic inequality, but when there is economic inequality, which there almost always is, it clearly has some effect on uh, who has voice and how they can express it. So what you want to do politically is create institutional arrangements that delimit how much that economic inequality can impact the political inequality. But it isn't just about the interaction between the economic and the political. So Elizabeth Anderson is a great segue here because um, I've been very influenced by her work on relational equality and by Daniel Allen's work as well, which is a little different, but is getting at the same set of issues about ensuring that when we talk about equal consideration, we mean that people are given um, relatively equal, and I always use the word relatively because it's never perfect, sure. relatively equal respect and dignity and that their voices are seriously taken into account. And that is very different than economic inequality or equality, which is can be measured by wealth or income. And somehow it always surprises me that people are not more outraged by political inequality, as you've just defined it. I mean, economic inequality, there's a story that says everyone strives to be rich and they think that eventually they will be rich, so they're happy that rich people exist now. But why aren't more people really upset? Maybe this goes into the empirical side of things. Why aren't people more outraged that economic inequality feeds so strongly into the size of voice you have in the political system? That is an empirical puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And one of the ones we're trying to resolve. That's, you know, I'm outraged. It sounds like your instinct is to be outraged. But in fact, a lot of people could care less. I mean, how deeply held is democracy as a value? And what do people mean by democracy? Do they even mean political equality mm. or equal consideration? So some people just mean you have a constitution that says one person, one vote, and you don't get in the way of it too much. But if you get in the way of it a little bit, that's okay. Um, other people don't seem to value that at all. And yet 
think they value democracy. So it's, it's a complex empirical puzzle, I think. Um, the other piece of it is that um, when you think about political equality, there is no no perfect set. There's no perfect equilibrium outcome. There are a lot of trade-offs here. So you improve the suffrage. I mean, this is back to the old problem that John Stuart Mill raised. Yep. You improve the subject, the suffrage. If you don't improve the education, do you get a worse electorate? Um, and what it, what it, what are you trading off for getting the worse a worse electorate, even though you're giving everybody equal voice? So I think you got to really think deeply about what the actual trade-offs are and face up to that. And that might help you get at some of these underlying reasons, um, even if people won't say them out loud, yeah. why they don't value political equality. Well, good. See, like you said right there in the sentence that I read at the start, uh, empirical social science is an important part of, of how you do these things. So. What does that mean for the people out there who are, you know, young proto-physicists or whatever, who have no idea what it means to do empirical social science? Like, are you out there doing experiments on people or what's going on? Personally, I am not <laughs> out there doing experiments on people, though I have no problem with those who are engaging in various kinds of experimental research. It means drawing on whatever tools and approaches are best for answering the question that you have at hand. And given the complexity of the world and the complexity of our skill sets, you might notice in my CV that I do an awful lot of collaboration and a lot of co-authoring because very few of us have all the skills you need to do the work. So, for example, in the Political Equality book, um, Tim Besley is a very distinguished econometrician. Now, I can sort of read what he does, um, and I can read, <laughs> but I can't do the kinds of sophisticated statistics that he does. And yet I value them and see that they really play an important role. Um, so I think it really depends on what the question is, and then making sure that you have the right people and skill set there to help you answer the question. The a lot of my work is actually archival, historical, interview work, um, my own personal work, or deep reading, uh, right. you know, bull pulling out of work that's art research that's already been done and synthesizing it in a new way. Those are That is still doing empirical research, but it's a different set of skill sets than collecting statistics or doing experiments. The bringing up of, of collaboration is interesting because I'm completely on board. I, I almost always collaborate myself. Uh, I'm now a, technically a member of the philosophy department faculty at Johns Hopkins, and we just had a meeting on to what extent we should let our graduate students collaborate on papers that will end up as part of their dissertations for the for the PhD. And, yes. and the philosophers just aren't used to this yet. So the, the more no. interdisciplinary ones in the room raise their hands and say, we've got to let our students collaborate because, you know, we, we're not trying to train them to be neuroscientists or physicists or whatever, but we want them to talk to those people. That's right. I'm, I'm totally on board with that, but I do see that that's a continuing problem in virtually every field, except oh, for some of the sciences, which are used to collaboration. Okay, so then you say that this combination of normative concerns and empirical social science leads you perhaps a bit counterintuitively to rational choice political economy. So number one, what do you mean by rational choice political economy? And number two, why is it counterintuitive that you'd be led there? Um, rash, so rash, let's start with what it is. Uh, rational choice uh, political economy is using the tools of basically economics, uh, microeconomics largely, and the kind of reasoning that goes into microeconomics and applying it to political problems and making the assumptions uh, that we no longer make, by the way, I no longer consider myself practicing. I never practiced traditional rational choice and even, I'm even farther from it now, but it certainly was an important part of my career. So that's why it appears in the autobiographical essay. But rational choices really makes the assumption that people are largely rational, that they have a sense, a clear sense of what their preferences are. Um, those preferences are transitive. If you prefer A to B and B to C, you're going to prefer A to C um, and B to, you know, and not prefer C to B. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that, that it, it makes certain assumptions about a kind of rationality. In the narrowest uh, version, and it's kind of decision theoretic, yeah. and in the narrowest version of it, it makes the assumption that individuals are narrowly self-interested, that their, their objectives really have to do with um, material and narrow, largely material and certainly narrow interests. They may include the family, but doesn't necessarily even have to go that far. So it's a very individualist approach. Its power, however, its limits are already obvious in what I've said, that its assumptions are relatively unrealistic and it's individualistic as opposed to thinking about networks or interactions, um, or the interactions only come from thinking about the individual and not interactions that are created by a group. Those are limits that I confronted early on. But it also um, has some power. It's parsimonious. It's rigorous. Um, when used with certain kinds of game theory, it lays out a, a way of thinking about the world that tells you that this is likely to happen um, and gives you reasons why things might not have happened or have happened. And if you can't find those reasons in the world, <laughs> Then something you can you can actually debunk your theory, mm. which is very hard to do, as we know. Sure. So it one it uh, it provided at least initially for me a form of discipline on doing historical or uh, ethnographic work, where what what details are essential to the story and which are not. How do I make that determination? And it also uh, gave me a way to think about, okay, if this detail exists, if this thing happened in the world, it shouldn't, then the outcome shouldn't have been X, it should have been Y. And yet the outcome in this historical event or this particular place was Y. So um, it was a great way to emerge from what I had learned, <laughs> which was <laughs> very fuzzy, I have to say, until I learned about some of this kind of thinking. I mean, I, I read great people. I learned a lot. I went to good universities. Yep. I mean, I have, I have no complaint about my education, but I didn't have... I couldn't find the right method for the kind of work that I was trying to do. So that's what rational choice is and why it was important to me. Why was it counterintuitive? Because rational choice was really identified with what we now call neoliberalism, what was called public choice, and represents a kind of, there's a bias many people believe is in it. I don't believe it need be in it but many people do believe is in it that leads it um, to be conservative or mm. to have a vision of the world and a set of values that I don't share. I'm not an individualist in that particular way, but that's part of what rational choice means to a lot of people. So I'll just give you a story to illustrate uh, the implication of that. So I went on my first sabbatical and came back and almost no one had, no graduate students except for three who I had known before had signed up for my graduate class, which was unusual, I have to say, for me. I was a fairly popular teacher. So I asked them what was going on. They said, well, the rumor spread around that you're rational choice and therefore deeply conservative. <laughs> And I said, what? You know that I'm probably the most radical person in the department. <laughs> they said, we know that. We tried to tell them, but they said, no, yep. she's rational choice. Rational Dismiss choice. it. <laughs> Which only ensconced me more in it because I don't like being dismissed on the grounds of something people don't understand. So that created a mission at the right. University of Washington, which I fulfilled ultimately. So <laughs> is, it, is it possible, you know, in a small number of words to... S explain why rational choice 
wouldn't be right. I mean, and, and you, you sort of defined it kind of narrowly, but couldn't we just expand the definition of rationality a little bit? And even if from the outsider's point of view, someone was acting irrationally, maybe from their perspective, given their values, could we figure out a way in which they're acting rationally? Or is that just not the right way to go in some big picture way? Well, that's how I started. Yeah. In fact, that was what I did. So I brought ethics in. Uh -huh. um, and ethical considerations uh, as part of the preference set of people, and that those norms that people were that were guiding people and affected their preferences were in fact often socially constituted, not just individually constituted. They came from a particular culture and context, which was another important piece of the puzzle for me. So again, let me make that concrete. Um, one of the pieces of research I did was on uh, conscription and volunteering for military service across six countries, five Anglo-Saxon democracies in France over 200 years, mm -hmm. basically the history of conscription and volunteering for military service as opposed to being impressed only <laughs> into military service. And one of the most interesting case studies was of the Francophones in Canada versus the Anglophones in Canada who had very different reactions to the First World War and the Second World War. And in the Anglophone case, they thought rah, rah to the two <laughs> world wars, Britain's under attack. We have to defend Britain. That means Canada's under attack because we're a dominion. Um, the Francophone said, wait a minute, our constitution for Canada and the, con the confederation principles say that we only have to be at war if Canada itself is under attack, not the empire. <laughs> and beside, and they said, well, what about the French? Don't you identify with the French? The French are under attack. They said the French left us on the ice <laughs> flows in the 17th century and then had a revolution and changed their, their religion. We don't care about the French. And they make fun of us when we come to Paris because <laughs> of our accents. All true. So all true, right? I'm, of course, characterizing, caricaturing the situation, but but what was going on was two very different cultures had emerged with very different views about how the central government was treating them. The Francophones felt very neglected. Many promises had not been kept about quality of education and quality of treatment and a whole variety of other things. The Anglophones, at least the Ontario Anglophones, felt uh, very good with the government. It was very much their government. So one, the Francophones did not volunteer for military service, whereas the Anglophones did at a very high rate. And when conscription came up for a vote, the Francophones voted it down and the Anglophones voted it up. The votes were like totally different. And this was in two different world wars. Hmm. Um, the same thing repeated itself in the Second World War. So, um, you know, that was a case where they were both acting rationally given their preferences, right. but they had different ethical maximans as well as interest maximans. In fact, if you were only going by narrow economic interest, you would have expected the Francophones who were poorer than the Anglophones to sign up at a higher rate because it was a job during a depression. And <laughs> we're talking yeah. about the second world war. So, um, you know, that was, that was where I used rational choice and I could in fact do some game theory. I could, I could, uh, lay out a whole set of, uh, counterfactuals as well as, uh, some, um, alternative, uh, hypotheses that were derived from the rational choice model, but I had different maximans right. in there or different preference rankings and different preferences than the normal economist doing rational choice, or even the normal political economist doing rational choice. And so this sounds very sensible in that a, a real person, real human beings, uh, don't just maximize their average income or expected income or something like that. They have other values that they care about, and they want to maximize their right. allegiance to those values. But then I think you're hinting that at the end of the day, you just don't think that the rational choice theory is the right way to go, even in that expanded sense. Well, I think there's still some value to some of it, just as there's lots of value to economics. I mean, I'm not throwing the baby out with the dishwater. But one of the things that happened during the course of my academic career was Kahneman and Tversky mm. um, and a whole lot of other research that's followed 
from that, which has just raised questions about the kind of rationality we use and where our biases come from and what are the sources of our beliefs that really has to be brought in. And so the story, rational choice is great because it's simple and parsimonious. And so there's still some ways I want to use it, but in order to fully explain the differences because of context, because of individual differences, because of group biases, um, you need more than rational choice can provide. And that has created a whole new frontier for those of us who are trying to combine some form of parsimonious theory. You just spoke with Henry Farrell. He's another one within this camp. Um, who is very committed to trying to think about parsimony Mm -hmm. and rigor, Mm -hmm. but also very committed to having the right kind of level of complexity in the understanding of the world and bringing context in um, institutions in the rational choice world initially was institution free. Um, is all individual. And so that that changed that changed too with Doug North and other the new economic institutionalists began to bring that in and I was very much part of that. So we were bringing institutions in but before you knew it we had it wasn't rational right. choice anymore <laughs> it was something. Um, and we're still it's a kind of political economy and we're still struggling to make it really work. You know, it reminds me of yet another podcast interview I did with T. Nguyen, who is a philosopher who actually studies the philosophy of games and gaming, like literal video mm-hmm. games, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then extends that to gamification and argues that the clarity of rules and rewards in a game is what makes them so seductive and attractive. And also ultimately what leads people to conspiracy theories, you know, very simple right. models that explain everything in the world. And maybe in a right. much milder form, I don't want to get in trouble here, but maybe that's the kind of reason why academics might be attracted to rational choice theory, right? It's simple, it seems rigorous, you can make predictions, might not always be right, <laughs> <laughs> but it has that level of rigor to which we aspire. Right. And, and you know, for certain kinds of problems, it can be right. Right. It's just that it, it, self, it selects the problems. And if you're interested in problems that aren't amenable to that particular method, and I often am, like political equality, <laughs> um, you know, where you can use bits of rational choice, but it's only going to get you so far. Right. Okay, let's go back to the French, uh, French Canadians and Anglo Canadians, um, and their differential responses to the draft. Because this is also an example not only of the modeling failures or successes, but of the bigger project that you've been involved with is trying to understand why citizens or people in society give their allegiance to a government, right? Why they give their. Right authority, the rights to make decisions over themselves to some form of government. So again, maybe, I don't know if you have a short answer to that question. That sounds like a very complicated one, but we can dig into it more uh, broadly. What is it that makes a person say, yes, I will let this government make up rules and then inflict them upon me? Well, I think there are a couple things, and um, and this predates democracies, it- because we've seen this happen in all kinds of regimes um, where I don't think people are being brainwashed. I feel like they are actually giving seating authority to government. And what generally does it is, uh, and this can be very simple, I mean, simple in statement, not simple in practice, let me put it that way. Um, They perceive the government as trustworthy. That is, They believe that the government has made some promises to them that it is likely to keep and seems to be keeping. They're often, but not always, economic promises. Um, They they can be about security, but they're in that material bucket, Mm. generally, um, including national security. Uh, That can be part of the, as it were, contract with the citizens. Um. So the first thing is that they perceive the government will provide things and will actually deliver on them. Uh, Two, uh, 
They believe that the process by which government is handing out the goods and making the decisions who will get the goods meets standards of fairness of the day and time and place. Uh, so they're not seeing their next door neighbor because she's young and beautiful getting all the perks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or their obese male neighbor getting all the perks because he owns the brewery. Right. Um, you know, whatever it is. Uh, that, that in fact, by the standards of the day, which obviously vary. And finally, and in many ways, this is, I guess, the thing that I brought into the story that not everybody had seen before which is that there is confidence that government will catch and punish the free riders. So those who don't accede to the authority and try to rip off the system in one way or another, even though they're getting the benefits of the system, will be punished. But that the government has the competence and capacity to deliver the goods as well as to locate and punish those who are free riding. So that makes for a trustworthy government. And when people perceive a government, and I'm using the word perceive here because it's not totally factual. I mean, there's a perceptual (laughs) element as we're seeing right now in the United States, strong perceptual element that can be influenced by other factors than reality. Um, But when they perceive the government as trustworthy, they're more willing to willingly comply or consent with its extractive demands. And it sounds like there's an, it, I don't know, if equal, but at least very big emphases both on having trust that the government is trying to be fair, uh, but then also that the government is competent, that the government is actually relatively That's right. successful. That's right. So competence and fairness are both critical elements here. And is this something that is this either especially or almost exclusively true for the founding generation of whatever governmental form we have, or is it co- kind of a constant renegotiation between the Constant citizens? renegotiation. Yeah. Constant renegotiation. So the government's job um, is to convince the citizens that it is trustworthy at all times. So one of the cases that I researched was a tax case in uh, Australia where a, the tax system had really gone awry. Not This is not an unusual problem. This was in democratic <laughs> Australia. I mean, it's not an unusual problem around the world right. that the tax system goes awry for a variety of reasons. But this was particularly egregious. So certain um, very certain well-off people could find tax loopholes and they were just getting benefits through the gazoo. And part of why that happened was because, and this is going to sound like a familiar story, um, Part of why that happened was the man who became the Supreme Court justice had been a tax lawyer (laughs) and he had failed to win some of these cases that made things loopholes. So he had the cases brought up again and this time they went through. Uh But think about workers whose taxes are taken out as they earn, right? They don't have a choice about loopholes and all the rest of that. And the Australian system is fairly simple. So there aren't a lot of deductions and Mm. stuff. So... What happened was a tax revolt and a political revolt Um, because it was hard to have a tax revolt, but you could have a political revolt. And the government was voted out and the Hawke government was voted in, a Labor Party government. And Hawke confronted the situation where the, the tax system was totally distrusted by a huge proportion of the population and particularly his constituents. And so he basically called a new constitutional convention. Now, some of that was smoke and mirrors, but the idea was to rethink the tax system, bring everybody into it, rewrite it, say we're starting again. Now, that's well after the founding. We're talking in the 1990s. Okay. Australia began in 1900. Um, not a lot of people left from that founding moment. By 1994, if they were, they weren't very effective in government. <laughs> yeah. And they'd been babies when, you know, it had started. Um, so it was really a new generation creating a new, as it were, fiscal contract uh, with the population. Is there some, this is the physicist. In the- we saw that with the New Deal. I mean, that's yeah. part of what the New Deal it was in principle about, right, in the U.S. This is uh, this is the physicist inside me talking, but is there some sense in, in which... You know, pressure builds up, and you know the government sort of 
accumulates a deviation from trustworthiness and then some kind of revolt happens, either financial or political or something like that, and the government has to correct itself. And if it goes too far, then we're in trouble. Sometimes. And sometimes it's sometimes that's the form it takes for sure. And sometimes it's a big rupture. Hmm. So, I mean, I think of recent history in the U.S. I mean, I found Trump a big rupture with what I understood government was supposed to be doing. And a big rupture in a way that, I mean, I didn't like many of both Bush's policies, but I didn't find them a rupture from my understanding of how government was supposed to work. I just disagreed with the policies. The different problem. Where does the difference come from? I mean, I I, I get also there is a difference. So is it a symptom of a pre-existing loss of trust or is it causing the loss of trust? Well, I think it can be both. I mean, I I think this is a complexity problem. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, of course, there's some buildup in either case because there's popular pressure that leads to a Trump. Um, but the actual break is very sudden as opposed to, I mean, there can be very gradual changes that may not be an effect of pressure at all. Um, it may simply be that you keep tweaking with something. I'll give you another example of that. Um, In the United States, we have the National Labor Relations Act, which was passed in the mid-1930s. It's still the law governing um, labor today, you know, how unions can form and what counts as a strike and how you appeal when an employer or a labor union is abusing its power or or the law. But, you know, we're now almost 100 years later. So that's a law that has gotten a little bit of tweak, a little bit of tweak, mostly in the administrative law side, not the big congressional law side. And so now you have a system that barely works at all. Right? (laughs) So it's a different kind of buildup of problem than the buildup of popular pressure about being unhappy about something. It, where you finally get a, something that just isn't working and everybody recognizes it, but doing something about it isn't always so easy. And it, again, my physicist had talking, it seems like a manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics that entropy increases and things become messier and more broken. And it doesn't seem like there's an obvious acknowledgement of that in governments, as far as I know, that over time systems will get less and less responsive. So we have to replace them. Is is there, do we have a predictive theory for that kind of behavior? Well, I'm trying now, of course, because you put me on the spot to think of the people who've, who've written like that, Mm -hmm. but there certainly are people who've made that argument, whether they use this, the second law of physics, I'm not sure. Um, But certainly people think along those lines. Okay, so going back to like the the trust that the that the people have in the government, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong because I've always had this sort of folk theory, and you know much more about this than I do. But in the 1990s, when Newt Gingrich was in charge of the Republican Congress and so forth, it seemed to me that there was a shift where people in Congress real like they did the game theory calculation and they realized that if what they wanted was to maximize their chance of winning office they would behave differently than if what they wanted was to maximize some particular policy preference outcomes. And in particular, negotiating with the other side is always bad, even if it leads to a policy that you like. And since then, that's made it a lot harder for the government to get things done. Is this just a figment of my imagination, or is there some correlation with reality there, you think? I think there's a correlation with reality, but I think it would be mistaken to think that that's the only time that's happened in the history of the United States or other democracies. You know, I think that there, the way in which you might recall that the uh, founding and they were all fathers um, conceived, uh, were very nervous about political parties because they would lead to this kind of competition and lead to this kind of view of interest. And they were worried about factions, um, even though they started with them and continued with them and, (laughs) Had to have a war over one yeah. of the biggest ones, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, that's been a constant tension, really, 
because there are some issues. The, the it, And periodically you get to a point, and this happened before the Civil War, and it's happened again now, and it's happened at other moments in other democracies, where you get to a point where some of the leadership just will not compromise. Mm -hmm. Compromise goes out the, the window. And then you get to a place where the country's ungovernable because democratic government, most governments, frankly, are based on some form of negotiation and bargaining. And you give up something and you get back something. I actually think one of the worst things that happened in Congress was when it gave up, um, no, I'm blocking the word for it, but uh, the side benefits you get, the pork. Oh, yeah, right. When it gave pork up barrel, pork barreling. Earmarks. I mean, there were, well, they're now called earmarks. When I was growing up, they were called pork barreling. <laughs> Um, I know what earmarks are. Yeah, they're the same thing. Yeah. But it's basically, you know, a way in which you can create trades. I mean, now that doesn't mean that all the pork barreling and all the earmarks are good and they certainly are expensive, but are they more expensive than not getting to any kind of agreement at all? And is an occasional bridge to nowhere the worst <laughs> thing that could happen to us? Yeah, no, that's a, actually, I mean, is that a... That seems perfectly sensible to me when you put it that way. I think that the the naive view is pork barrel politics is corrupt and it's just buying votes, et cetera. But if you cast it as the price you have to pay to get things done, then maybe it's worth the cost. And is that a consensus view among political scientists or is that something that is not? It's a view. It's a I don't, view. you know, is there a consensus view among political scientists? No, yeah. not about anything. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but that certainly is a view. I mean, I'm, I'm not the only one to have said that. No. And even think about, you know, you think about um, what you were, the, so even, even if you're not in the Gingrich world and refusing to compromise you, all, almost all Congress people and senators are in the world where they have to worry about pleasing their constituents or they can't to some extent, or they can't be reelected. Now, occasionally someone will take a very principled stand, as we recently saw, um, and she loses big yeah. um, in her home state, right? But mostly people have to pay attention to what their constituents believe they need or bring home some pork to the constituents. And that's not necessarily leading to lack of compromise. It can actually enhance compromise in those kinds of situations. And that's recognizing the reality that representatives have two roles to play, and we haven't figured out how to enhance their ability to play both at once. One is to deliver to their constituents, to act, actually represent those who elected them, and the other is to resent, represent the whole polity, bringing the voice of their constituents into the wisdom of the crowds. And is there any way that you've noticed historically from other times when trust in government has broken down that we can recover from that? Are there things that governments successfully do to get working again? Uh, I mean, I guess there's two hidden questions that I'm trying to ask at once. One is this... Is there a way to get people in the government compromising and being effective at passing legislation again? And number two is, are there ways to get people to think that the government is fighting for them? Yeah, two very different questions. Right. So the first question, the most effective way to get people to work together is a war. Uh, too bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at the historical record, the times when countries really pull together and overcome those partisan and sectarian differences is often when they're under threat. Now, the threat need not be a war. It has generally been a war. It could be climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I keep hoping that the environmental crisis we're facing might evoke that. So far, it hasn't. It could be COVID. It didn't do it. But my prediction at the beginning, my wrong prediction, was that it would have, um, that here was a common threat we were all facing where a solution had to be find, found, and in the meantime, we had to work together to protect each other and ourselves. Um, but in principle, those kinds of, ex those kinds of threats um, should have or can have, and in some countries they did, Taiwan they did, 
um, not just because it was small, just, but because it managed that the threat of COVID in a very different way. Um, so it can, under certain circumstances, institutional and leadership circumstances, have that kind of consequence. I'm not asking for threats. Yeah. <laughs> but that I'm just recognizing empirically that that's a major way in which it happens. You know, a more benignly, um, it's really, I mean, I think this is what Biden and other leaders have been trying to do, uh, right and left. Mm -hmm is to really try to clarify to the public what's at stake right now and how we have to be uh, engage in a common purpose if we're going to ensure that the United States be a peaceful, healthy, growing place that can encourage flourishing of most of its population. Um, those attempts have seldom totally succeeded, but they're not, they do get some distance. I mean, Biden's done a remarkable job, I think, in the last less than a year, certainly not at the beginning, but now in this past year in getting things passed. And part of that is recognizing the art of compromise. But okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, put forward a pessimistic take here that, that maybe you'll just go along with, maybe you'll refute, I'm not sure. But like you say, we could have predicted that something like COVID or maybe something ongoing, like uh, also ongoing, like climate change, is a common threat that would bring us together. But in some very real sense, that is not happening. Uh, because in some very real sense, the information ecosystem is making it the case that there are no more common threats. No matter how bad a threat is, it will be politicized and polarized. And that might be one of the signs that our society is just breaking down in, in that sense. Is, is that something that I should really take seriously? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I I mean, it could be. Say. I'm hoping it's not. Right. I'm hoping there are ways out of this. Um, you know, and to say that the... Um, Information ecosystem, yes, it's faster, it's more intense now, but newspapers used to do that. They were different newspapers for different publics. Yep. Uh, radio stations did that. Um, television does that. I mean, we're not just talking about the digital media here. Uh, so it's been an ongoing, I mean, the, the, the printing press did that. You know, just having access to different sources of information controlled by diff not just the church or the state. Um, as soon as that was opened up, um, you were going to begin to have some of these kinds of conflicts. So the question really is um, not that they're going to exist or that they're going to happen again, but how do we overcome them when they do? How do we create some common sense of understanding, at least around some key facts? Um, and I think that's the really tough question that social scientists are facing today. Right. Uh, this, this period has really revealed uh, how deeply held false beliefs can be, impermeable to the kinds of things that we thought information was permeable to. And I guess that is one very big worry, simply false beliefs at a, at a factual, empirical level. But the other big worry is... Uh, this no longer thinking of ourselves as part of a common future, a common uh, society, right? I mean, there's people right. on both sides are talking about civil war and or d dividing the country up or something like that. And maybe this is also true outside the U.S. I'm just not as familiar. It is true outside the U.S., yeah. Yeah. And I mean, look, Scotland isn't sure it wants to be part of Britain. It hasn't for a long time, but it's right. becoming... And Catalonia doesn't want to be part of Spain. I mean, the UK didn't want to be part of Europe, right? Right. And so, all right, that sounds like a tough challenge for democracy. Like, I always like to say that democracy is not about you vote and the winner gets their choice, but you vote and the loser has to put up with the winner's choice. And, and we seem right. increasingly unwilling to go along with that philosophy. I think that's right. But there are, there are a couple of ways possibly out of that dilemma. 
One is to really, as many people are right now, really look deeply at what we mean by democracy and how it's being practiced and um, see if that's encouraging this kind of splintering as opposed to overcoming this kind of splintering and how we can fix that. Another is to think of democracy itself as an experiment that may have reached its limits. And I'm not saying we go to autocracy, there may be, or authoritarianism, but there may be other ways in which we can self-govern that are different than what we've inherited in so many countries from the past, that maybe this particular kind of system just no longer works for the kinds of complexities of the world today. I don't have that alternative in mind. I, lots of people are engaging in experiments and thinking about that. And, you know, I'm focused on the first about how we can right. fix the democracy that we have. But I'm open to the second as a real possibility because it may be that this is unfixable. And then we better have people out there really being imaginative and thinking about what do we put in its place? Well, that's a- as opposed to, a, a, you know, a, a terrible leader who is, um, you know, we don't want demagoguery. So uh, we've got to find an alternative at some point. So just to get us thinking, because this is a a fascinating idea that I'm not very familiar with. I mean, what kind of alternatives might there be, even if they're bad and we haven't hit on the right one yet, that would be sort of not autocratic, but not a democracy either, and yet let people ultimately be giving authority to the state that is governing them? Well, they're not democracy in the sense in which we have practiced representative democracy. So they may still be democratic. Okay. Um, For example, there are a lot of experiments going on with elections by lottery and large numbers of people. And, you know, you just get picked like you get picked for the draft and you have to go serve for two years in the legislature and you're just a normal person. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And you have to learn things and you have to realize where expertise is useful and where it's not. And, you know, but there are a lot of experiments going on with that kind of thing. There are experiments going on with uh, public bargaining. I mean, public uh, budgeting. Mm. Um, where certain parts of the budget uh, are subject to a very democratic public process in the community where that budget is going to have an effect. Uh, Those are a couple of the experiments that are going on. There are things going on using uh, digital tools that give people voice in a variety of ways. Uh, There's some cyber experiments. I mean, there are all kinds of things that are happening that I think are worth really paying. Radical Exchange is an organization that has encouraged a lot of different experiments. Um, Alain Landemore, who is a philosopher at Yale, has written about a variety of ways in which constitutions and other kinds of policies can be made in a much more public way, um, engaging many more people. I'm just citing two Mm -hmm. concrete people, organizations um, who've thought about changing changing the processes of voting in very radical ways, as as uh, Glenn Weil has advocated and, and uh, uh, yeah, as others have advocated. You know, I once... On- I mean, those are all worth considering. I, I'm not advocating sure. any no, no, of no, no. them. I get because- it. I, I once on Twitter, half tongue-in-cheek, suggested that if a wealthy person runs for national office, they have to give up almost all their wealth if they win. (laughs) The idea being that (laughs) it would really be, if you wanted to be a public servant, you would really be doing it for the sake of being a public servant. Uh, Right. And I, I, it was one of the things I put on Twitter occasionally that just was universally condemned. People thought that I was completely right. nutso for saying that, like, you know, how dare you exclude the best and brightest from serving their country, which maybe goes back to the equality discussion that we started with. But, you know, it's, it's a, yet another maybe tweak, I would say, on the process of democracy rather than giving up on democracy altogether. That's right. So there are three possibilities here, right? There's one, fixing the democracy. We have two, finding some fairly radical changes to the kind of democracy we have, the lottery systems Mm. or the um, 
some of these voting systems are not like anything we've ever practiced before or anybody's ever practiced, except in very small communities, maybe in ancient Greece, um, or really finding a serious alternative to democracy. There are people, And I think all those are on the table. There are people who want a constitutional convention, but that scares the living daylights out of me to imagine what would actually come out of such a thing. I mean, this goes back to the trust that we have in our fellow citizens. Uh, I, I'm kind, Even though I think that the current system is not great, uh, I worry about realistic changes to it making things much worse. Well, here's where institutions can create the trust. I'm not saying, and it's not easy to do. So again, it's not like, oh, here's a simple solution. Let me just write you a prescription, dear, and you'll be fine. Um, but go to go back to that case of Hawke and the kinds of constitutional convention that he created around the the tax law. What he did was set up a set of arrangements that people had real confidence in, that their voices would be heard, even mm. though they were disparate voices that they would be heard, that they would be respected, that they actually had a chance of making a difference um, and created a circumstance in which people could argue civilly and enforce that. So that's a set of institutional arrangements that then create confidence that you can go into that forum and be treated with respect and not be allowed to act in a way now, that's not easy to do, particularly in a world, I mean, that was a conflictual world. This is an even more conflictual world, the one we're in right now, with with real antagonisms and anger of a level that is um, something I have seldom experienced in my lifetime. I've seen it. I mean, I lived through McCarthyism. Yeah. I lived through the war in Vietnam. This is not totally out of keeping with some of the things. My mother says McCarthyism, she's no longer with us, so I don't know how she'd feel about now. But she <laughs> said McCarthyism was the most dangerous was the most dangerous and disturbing thing she ever lived through. Right. Um, in the history of her long life. And she lived to about a century, for about a century. So um, died just as Trump got elected. Um, it, and it seems like there's something completely legitimate about people's feelings that the government is not responsive to their needs, right? I mean, people on the left and the right, this is sort of a cross-polarization thing, but it, it, it is certainly too simplistic, but is part of the problem just that the institutions that we deal with on a daily basis are just so big that individuals are ignored by them on a regular basis? Well, I think that is part of it. I mean, bureau bureaucracy should not be underplayed here as having a role. And even though the bureaucracy in principle is, in principle, is treating people fairly, um, somehow being treated as exactly the same. And I mean, the bureaucracy is not competent these days when, you know, it can't, we've got, we've got so many regulations that have divided the bureaucracy. So, I mean, I'll give you a silly example. I just finished running the center where Henry Farrell is currently a fellow, the Center for oh, Advanced yeah. Study and Behavioral Studies. And um, we're doing a construction project up there, the first construction project since the place was built. One day I come there and the road leading up to the center is being redone. We're about to have big trucks going down <laughs> the road and up the road. This is all being done, this is all under the supervision of Stanford. One piece of the bureaucracy wasn't talking uh, to another piece of the bureaucracy. Right. And just take that to the level of a country. Right. How many times have we run into, you know, one regulator saying one thing and another regulator saying another thing and they're both right within their narrow thing but they're not talking to each other. Um, if you think about Someone I very much admire is a woman named Hillary Cottam, C-O-T-T-A-M. She's currently a, a fellow at New America, but she's uh, an important designer and player in Britain. Mm -hmm. And she's basically trying to build an alternative to the current welfare state. Okay. In which in the current welfare state, you're a poor family. Let's say some of your members are dysfunctional, they're alcoholic, or they're addicted. Some are truant. Uh, some are disabled, some are unemployed, some are breaking the laws. You have different people coming in to the same person 
with each of those different things. So you might have 10 people or 20 people coming into this family and they're not talking to each other. So her idea is to, and therefore you lose all trust in government. Mm. One person's telling you one thing, one person's telling you something else, one person's not paying any attention whatsoever um, or can't provide the kind of help you need. So she's trying to create a system that is actually starts with the family and what it needs or a unit and what it needs and then building a bureaucracy or a set of carers who respond to that as opposed to them. So the police works with the social worker, not separately. And that's, that's an indication of what I think your question originally was, that we've lost confidence right. in the competence here of government. Not because the individuals aren't necessarily competent, but because the system has proven itself unwieldy and not really delivering what we fundamentally need, And even though it does give us certain things. I mean, we're not living in the pre-government sure, world. Sure, sure. But also, we're not even only living in the government world, right? There's all these different right. interlocking systems that affect our lives. That's right. Just before we started doing this recording of the podcast, I had a moment of abject fear because my internet seemed to be out. <laughs> I thought yeah. I was going to be in trouble. But also, I felt a little bit powerless. It turns out it was my computer's fault, not Verizon's fault. But, you know, we and, and probably maybe I'm guessing people don't even distinguish between the faceless bureaucratic nature of the internet company and the healthcare provider and the government and the police. It's all something against which their individual needs seem to sort of, you know, rattle right. helplessly against. And so. Well, I do think they sometimes distinguish the police from the others, at least in countries <laughs> where police carry guns. Um, I think that's the one they can distinguish. Um, no, but that that's absolutely true. There's a merger of all that. One of my graduate students, from a long time ago, Audrey Sachs, who's now at the World Bank, her dissertation work was trying to find out in Zambia whether the aid that people were getting, whether they attributed it to the government who made the roads possible and brought the Gates Foundation or whoever in, mm -hmm. or whether they attributed it to the Gates Foundation. Um, you know, how much credit does government get for the things that it makes possible? Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't that much. <laughs> wasn't that that much, huh? Okay. Well, okay. I mean, let, let's think a little bit more because this is, I think that uh, I've been shortchanging a lot of what you're currently working on, which is about making things better, right? And, and you do, you put a lot of thought into how do we get people to recoup or recover that sense of shared fate toward the future? I mean, maybe you can say a, right. a little bit about how we can we can try to get back to that state where we're all in the same boat. Or I don't know whether getting back is the right formulation, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm not sure getting back is. Yeah. And there are cases where there have been, well, I mean, we all have. So the term that John Alquist and I used was community of fate, F-A-T-E, not faith, but the interlinking of people. And subsequently, I've expanded that to say inclusive and encompassing um, community of fate so that we're talking more broadly. Because if you think about it, all of us, almost all of us, unless we're psychopaths or sociopaths, uh, live in some kind of community of fate. It may just be our immediate family. Um, it may be our uh, religious community. It may be an ethnic community. Um, but many of us live in situations where we feel responsible to people who are not our immediate relatives um, and hope that they feel some obligation to us. And that can be community created. I'm interested in how to replicate that in places where it doesn't exist and how to expand it um, so that it's not just I will help someone who looks like me or sounds like me or lives next door to me, but will even consider um, making significant sacrifices in some cases for far distant others who can never reciprocate, but who are deserving of my care and attention. And what this is again, where empirical and normative mm -hmm. interact back to the original issue. So my question, my nor you know, I'm interested in trying to create these kinds of communities, and I'm interested. Those are that's a normative concern. I'm interested in how to evoke from people 
that part of themselves which is pro-social and not just privately self-interested, because I recognize both of our both are in us. And there are times when my survival might take precedence over everything else. I get it. Um but I'm interested in where we can evoke from people that pro-social behavior. Um, what we were talking about in a way about the representatives actually acting in the public good, not just in their private interest or just in the interest of a narrow set of citizens. And I found that the answer, we, John Alquist and I studied some labor unions that had succeeded in doing this, as well as some that had not done that, but were in the same sector attracted the same kind of workers. So these were transport sector unions. They were longshore workers and truck drivers in the United States and Australia. So basically the same kind of people. Um, and they were all heterogeneous politically. We could document that. I mean, they weren't all Republicans. They weren't mm -hmm. all Democrats. They weren't all radicals. They weren't all radicals on the right or radicals yep. on the left. Um, they were a mixture. And yet one set of organizations was able to evoke these kinds of commitments and another set of organizations were not. And it really came back to a set of government arrangements that were created in whatever the crucial constitutional moment for that union was and a kind of leadership that was committed to sustaining that. So the governance arrangements that evoke pro-social behavior involve a rank and file democracy. The, the workers actually vote on the contracts directly and they um, vote and discuss all kinds of things. It required uh, socialization. So they learn the norm that you fight for what you believe in. You sometimes lose, you sometimes win, but you go on and discuss it again another day. That becomes an important norm. It, it, it required socialization in terms of education about the world, not just about these norms, but what the world actually looks like and what's actually happening in the world. So that if you came to, if some leadership came or even some members came to the rank and file and said, see those ships over there, they're in Australia and Sydney, they're loading ammunition um, for the Dutch to put down the rebellion in Indonesia. And the workers could say, they could have the reaction, which many of them did right off the bat, that's not fair dinkum. We can't <laughs> allow that to happen. You know, people have a right to rebel. Yeah. Others could say, are you sure? Prove to me that, that those are that's ammunition, that that's going into a Dutch ship and that Dutch ship is going to Indonesia to put down a rebellion. So that required a discussion in which they had to really evaluate the kind of information they were getting and come to some kind of collective understanding of it by arguing with each other. Now, they'd already created some community for a basis to do that by the socialization of norms, by working together and other things, which are definitely an advantage over starting sui generis, um, but not in Super Bowl things. I mean, we can create circumstances where people's kids go to school together, mm -hmm. where people work together, where people play together, where people form communities around all kinds of things. We know that they do that. Soccer clubs, um, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then to actually create circumstances where they were taking a vote and putting something on the line, um, some kind of sacrifice, giving up a day's work because, and therefore pay, possibly facing going to jail, um, something on the line that, uh, for this action. And they could, be, they could feel efficacious. In this case, and that's the trickiest part, actually, about how to scale this, because these were longshoremen or truck workers who could actually stop something from happening. They could not right. load they had the some cargo power. or unload yeah. the cargo. Most of us can't find that point of leverage. So that's the sort of next thing that I'm working on is where are those points mm. of leverage? How do you create those communities or the basis for those communities so that people will begin to talk to each other? They'll come into the room and have that constitutional debate without tearing each other apart. How do you create enough of a structure around that so that they can do that? And then how do you give them something where they can feel that they've been efficacious, right. that 
by acting they've done something. Now, what I find remarkable in this contemporary world is what some of the kids have done around climate change, some of those. And they're, I mean, they don't feel like they've won, but they certainly feel like by mobilizing, by shutting down schools at times, by doing things, that they're acting and that they're getting beginning to get heard, that they're beginning to get recognized. And that's a form of efficacy. So I think there are ways to do this. And I, you know, Hari Han, who you mentioned earlier, is someone who thinks a lot about these issues, Marshall Gans. It's people who come out of the social movement sort of background or literature who really want to think about what's the next step here. We want to get beyond the social movement, the Arab Spring that erupts and dies, but how do you actually create that expanded and inclusive community of fate that is able to sustain itself and is willing to really evoke from people pro-social behavior when it's important to engage in pro-social behavior, which is not all the time. This is not about being sure. self-sacrificial every moment of your day and night. This is not being a martyr. And I think some of those things you just said just instantly make sense. Like if you're experiencing different kinds of people and different kinds of lifestyles, maybe you get to humanize them amongst yourselves a little bit more. But but the one that I really liked is the idea that when you do, if I, tell me if I'm misrepresenting this, but when you do something for somebody else or for another group, you become more invested in their success. It's not when they do something for you that you, you feel you owe them, then, then you start feeling resentful. But when you give right. them something, you want them to do better. And I, I love that idea. And, and that, that sounds like something we should figure out institutions to make that happen a lot more. And the way we saw that first was actually empirically was so the very first actions that the longshore workers on the west coast of the u.s did of this sort and the australian longshore workers did was in response to the chinese communities in the cities like san francisco and sydney in melbourne who came to the longshoremen and said look what the japanese this was the 1930s look what the japanese are doing to manchuria mm -hmm. and to the peasants in manchuria those are our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. And the longshore said, who have a, a slogan, um, oh, an injury to one is an injury to all. Right. An injury to one is an injury to all. So when the Chinese came to the longshore workers and said, those are our brothers and our sisters, um, the longshore workers said, they're our brothers and sisters too, even though we'll never meet them and they can never do anything for us and we probably never even will have a meal at their house. But you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. If it could happen to them, it could happen to us. And we've, so there were two motivations. One, you feel better by doing something, but also you feel like you're protecting your own world mm -hmm. and what you value in your own world if you act on behalf of others whose worlds are under threat. I mean, I want this to happen. It sounds maybe a little bit utopian. Uh, is, are it's we very old? utopian, but yeah. this is a proof of it happened. Right. Right. I mean, this, exactly. these Good. are groups that actually did it and they continue to do it and they've survived for over 80 years with an organizational framework that looks like this despite technological change. So it's the proof of the possible, not the yeah. proof that it will be possible, but the proof that it can be done. And is it completely, is it, is it a very unfair question to say, could we apply that kind of reasoning to polarization in the United States between very uh, QAnon people and, you know, the, the wokest folks out there? I would like to believe so, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not sure. There may be some people, I mean, there needs to be some, some level of willingness to have a conversation. Right. So... That I think the Q, the wokeness, I don't know if they're willing to have a conversation. Some are, some aren't. The QAnon, not at all, Probably as far not. as we can tell. Right. So I think there is, you know, there have been times in this country and other countries where there's been some minority, sometimes a significant minority, that will hear no reason. And you just have to live with don't that worry about those and try people. to contain yeah. it. I don't mean kill the people off. I mean, but try to contain the damage that they can do. Good. Okay. But then for the 80% in between the extremes, um, again, unfair question, but is it, are, the, are there institutional changes that rather than just, you know, being kumbaya and let's all get together, can we change the system in such a way as to get those people into 
mutual um, uh, dependency, I guess, helping each other? Yes, I think there are. I mean, and I think it's around um, probably starting, I mean, there may be ways to do it big, but probably starting around things that are smaller, either smaller issues or smaller organizations um, where people um, already share some common interests, see the problem, may have different solutions. So I'm thinking about... um, Schools, right? You know, right now the schools are a place of yelling and screaming uh, by parents against each other and against school boards. But one could imagine rejiggering all of that institutionally, so that you're allowing a lot of different voices to be heard in a sensible way, and not allowing one group to take control. I mean, that there that would have to be blocked. Um, so that you could continue to hear, obviously things that are totally out of bounds would have to be totally out of bounds, things that are illegal or totally racist or whatever. We always have those delimitations on any structure that we have, but we could find ways of reconstituting some of these institutions that are clearly not working in a way that begins to evoke this kind of behavior and attitude. I think this is a very good point. Like, I think I tend to err on the side of just wanting to fix everything at once at the highest level. But I think you're you're a more empirically grounded social scientist than I am in pointing out that oftentimes probably starting at the small levels and letting things bubble up might be a better strategy. Well, but there are also larger cases where things might work. So Marshall Gans, who I mentioned, has been working with mayors um, and in the United States And if you think about the mayors in the United States, they are incredibly diverse Mm -hmm. on absolutely every dimension you can think of, including what you just mentioned is woke and QAnon. I mean, you've got you've got that in there, too, um, as well as all the other kinds of ways in which people can be different from each other. And he's able through a series of strategies to get them to listen to each other and to talk to each other. And I think that's another good starting place. Now, here's here's an organization that already exists, the Organization of Mayors. Here's something where there is some common interest. They're all coming to these meetings, but they need to find a way to have a conversation with each other across these boundaries. And there are strategies to enable them to begin to have that conversation, and then you build from there. That sounds... And you're not going to achieve everything because there are going to be, let's not forget, there will be real policy differences. So you can't expect to, there will never be a kumbaya moment. Politics is about conflict and controversy. That's what it's about. And people trying to wield power over each other. It is. And I'm a big fan of not forgetting the substantive policy differences. Uh, There are certain attempts at new political parties that seem to want to paper over that. And I think it's important to keep them in mind. But I mean, maybe as the as the very final question, I'll ask something completely different. Um, because you mentioned in the memoir article and elsewhere your willingness to think about the biggest problems within these spheres that you are working on. Uh, is how unusual is that? Are there enough people thinking about the big problems? Should we be encouraging more people to think about the big problems? And and are, does it make sense to put our efforts into thinking at this biggest scale? Complicated question, because at one level, there are lots of people thinking about the big problems, but they're doing it in a sort of op-ed kind of way from my perspective, or popular books, um, TED Talks, not that I haven't given a TED Talk, but, <laughs> um, you know, but it's it's a different way of going about taking a big problem on. And then there are people who are rigorous scholars who are trying to address big problems using the best tools of the trade. And often what I mean by taking on a big problem is addressing a big problem, but getting at it through. So to understand how citizens and governments get along, I look at a series of case and under what conditions there will be compliance, consent, dissent. I look at a series of case studies of conscription, of of military service, of taxation, Um, of very concrete things to understand how you evoke pro-social behavior, a big question. I 
you parse it by looking at an organization which has succeeded in doing it and contrasting it with organizations that are quite similar but made different choices at different parts of the path. So my way of looking at a big problem is through often through a series of small bits of the big problem that then get married together. And I'm not alone in that, Mm -hmm. um, though different people have different strategies of how to do it. Um, What distinguishes me is my, from the rational choice group that I emerged from, was that I was willing to admit that these were the big problems. I wasn't just trying to find out why, you know, people complied with taxes in this part of ancient Rome in these years, but really how it spoke to the larger question of when people will comply with or avoid or actually get engage in tax revolts um, in response to the extractions of government. That sounds Sometimes like a- killing the tax collectors. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it sounds like a very good point. I bet that there's plenty of academics who assume that once you start thinking about big problems, you've moved into the realm of TED Talkers and pundits and away from serious academia. But by keeping yourself grounded in the specifics might be a way to you know, really make progress on the big problems through rigorous work. And there are a number of people who do that. I mean, I am not alone in that. No, I don't think so. But uh, you're definitely a, a good example of it. And I like to end on an optimistic note. So I think that's a very good place to do it. Margaret Levy, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>